Good morning, Silver Creek. Welcome to our worship service this morning. Let's have prayer before we begin here. Father, we thank you for this day and for this time when we can come together and worship you and praise you. Father, we're so thankful for all you have done, for your love for us. And we pray that we might worship you today in spirit and in truth. And we give you thanks for your presence being with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now join us today in our singing. We will begin with Down From His Glory and Come Thou Long Expected Jesus.
morning, and I encourage you to have prayer together with your families today as well. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the day and for the worship today. Father, we pray today for our country. We pray that your spirit, the spirit of the gospel, might revive us. And we pray, Father, that we might all rededicate our lives to you, our Savior. Father, we thank you for the great bounty you've given us. And we pray also today for those who are sick and afflicted. We pray for their well-being, for their healing, for their spiritual needs. Father, we pray for those who may be lonely. And the Father, give them strength and courage. And Father, we thank you for all your blessings, for your help throughout our day and our week. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing Ring the Bells.
candle of hope symbolizes promises delivered through the prophets from God as well as the hope we have in Christ. God crafted a great rescue plan that he lays out in scripture. This plan foretells years in advance the arrival of Christ. The Bible also gives us a glimpse of the future and promises that God will come down to create a new heaven and earth. The first Sunday of Advent, we read, pray, and reflect on the hope God plans gives us, foretold by prophets and fulfilled by the life and death of Christ. And we meditate on the promises of Christ's coming, glory-filled return. Let's read from Isaiah 64, 1 through 5. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to the, your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right and those who remember you in your ways. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, let your hope arise in our hearts. Lift our eyes up to see that you alone are where our hope comes from. Help us to shake off the anxiety, discouragements, and distractions that have filled this year. May we pause to remember that we have hope in you. You know the end of our stories, and we give thanks because you have promised that it will be a victorious ending. Give us the grace we need to wrap up this year joyfully. We invite your spirit into this beautiful Advent season. Renew our sense of holy anticipation. Let us be those who are waiting eagerly for Jesus to come again. More than anything, we ask that you be glorified in this season of expectation. In your name, amen. Good morning, Pastor Mark here. And um, I just want to start off by thanking you uh, for your prayers for me. And it's been a longer road than I thought with this uh, COVID-19 and the pneumonia that I've had. And so I just want to thank you for your prayers. And I could feel them when I was in the hospital. I can feel the prayers when I'm here at home. And uh, just continue to pray for me. Um, I'm not a very patient guy. And I want to be up and about and moving around. And so I am just asking that you pray that I'll be patient and that I'll be a good patient and I will uh, do what I need to, to, to rest up and to recover. And so just continue to pray for me as I pray for you as a church. And we look forward still as your transitional interim pastor, we look forward to um, you guys calling a new pastor uh, to lead and to guide you. And it's been a privilege and an honor uh, to be your transitional interim pastor. Uh, today we're starting a new series. Uh, the new series is entitled um, The Gift of Grace. So I'm going to pray for us and we will get started. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. And I pray, dear Lord, that you'll give me the strength and energy I need <coughs> uh, to get through this talk and may it be uplifting and encouraging. So now may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart may be pleasing in your sight. For you are our rock and you are our redeemer. When it comes to Christmas, I have a confession. Um, I don't like the gift giving part when it comes to Christmas. Um, I, yeah, sure. I love to shop for people. I love giving gifts. Um, maybe it's a little bit of uh, uh, something weird about me, but when it comes to giving or getting gifts, I find myself often disappointed. Uh, often when my kids ask me, well, dad, what do you want for Christmas? I'm like, I don't know. Underwear or socks, you know? I think it's because I don't want to be disappointed with the whole process of what I'm going to receive as a gift. And when it comes to 
to these Christmas exchange we do, um, they make no sense to me. I don't know if I'm a practical person, but if you're gonna do a gift exchange for $20, $30, $50, $100, I mean, the purpose is to go out and, and to buy something of equal value and exchange it. Well, that's not a gift exchange, that's just an exchange. Uh, today, as we start a new series, on the gift of grace, we're gonna look at a gift that uh, we all need to appreciate, to accept, um, to, to just sort of own it and, and to receive it because it's a gift not from somebody else and it's not a gift exchange, it, it's a gift from our Heavenly Father who loves us. And so today we wanna talk about the gift of grace, the gift of grace. And what we're going to do as we go through this series is I'm going to try to focus in on one verse that we can take with us as we learn more about grace. And so today is sort of going to be like an introductory uh, message on the grace of God and why it's considered a gift. And I hope that it will benefit you um, in your own Christian walk and that it will be encouraging. One thing I love about uh, Christmas time is Christmas is about the good news, <laughs> the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, Christmas is also uh, about the good news that produces great joy in our lives. And so I'm hoping that this series on grace will be good news to you and it will present a great joy in your life. As I have tried to live the Christian life, every time I've gotten myself into trouble, I've tried to earn God's favor, or I've tried to do good deeds by myself and um, with my human effort, with my human desire, but I always fall short. And I've seen so many Christians struggle to know whether they are saved, whether God loves them, whether God accepts them, whether they can be um, safe and secure in a relationship with their Heavenly Father and with Jesus Christ. And hopefully today and throughout this series, you will learn that God's grace is not only rich, but it's free, and it's an inexpressible gift that God has given each one of us. So to get us started, we're going to be looking at Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 today. Um, We've looked at this in the past, I know, but I just want to focus in on this topic, the gift of grace. And so I would encourage you uh, later today, go back and read all of Ephesians 2, uh, 1 through 10. But here's where I want to start. Notice in 2, 1, it says, you were dead. <laughs> that means you were not spiritually alive. You, you, you didn't have any function at all. You didn't have any purpose at all. You were spiritually dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world. It's saying that our life was off track and we were lost. We were walking in darkness. We were walking in sin. It means also that not only did we do things wrong, we went do the things that were right when we needed to do them. Then it says, in our deadness, we were following this prince of the power of the air, which is uh, the evil one, which is Satan. And it says, we all lived in the passions of our flesh. We were all selfish. Um, we all wanted to do things our own way. We were full of pride and, and arrogance. It says we were carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath. Now, this is important to understand. We were by nature children of wrath. That means that we were doomed for the wrath of God. Um, that, it, that is ultimately hell, um, but it is the judgment of God against the sins that we have committed, and the again, the good deeds that we haven't done as well. And so we were objects of wrath. God, 
God was angry with us. We like to talk about the love of God, but God was angry with our sin and our disobedience and our desire to live for our flesh. But verse four says this, it says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love. Notice this, this is so awesome. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he had loved us. God looked at us as still as sinners, as the Bible says, and he loved us and he loved us greatly. Um, we're going to see that's sort of part of the definition of what grace is all about. It says, even when we were dead in our sins, God made us alive together with Christ Jesus. So we were made alive by God, Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to notice here in verse 5 that it says something powerful. It says, by grace, you have been saved. It's going to be important. Paul didn't have to say this again. But he's emphasizing God's grace. He says, by grace, you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we got a new identity. We got a new authority. We got a new position. Then notice verse 8. This is the verse I want to focus in on. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. This is the gift of God. Again, let me say this again. And by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one can boast. Today we want to talk about this grace. Now, I want to share with you this verse in more detail. And I got it up on the screen now. And so I just want you to look at this verse. Notice what it says. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. If I was in church, I would say, can I have an amen? Um, this is just such wonderful truth. It's telling us something here. Notice that we have been saved by grace. The basis and the means of which we are saved is by grace, which, by the way, you can't keep your salvation by your works if you are saved by grace. So he says the basis of our salvation is by grace, and it is through faith. The vehicle or the way we obtain the salvation and the way we obtain the grace of God is by faith. That word faith means to have trust, confidence, and the promises and the provision of God. We'll talk a little bit more about that, hopefully, as we go throughout this series. And then it says, this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. If you have your Bible, I would encourage you to circle this word, the gift of God. Or is it this phrase, the gift of God? This Christmas, I want you to re realize a very important truth. That God has given you a gift. You say, who, me? Yes, you. God has given you a gift. And yes, we can talk about the gift of of, of God's word. We can talk about the gift of salvation. We can talk about the gift of Jesus Christ, the gift of forgiveness of sins, the gift of being adopted into God's family. But we want to look really into what we're talking about today. I'm talking about the gift of grace 
but we want to go a little bit deeper and understand that this gift we're talking about is not just grace. It's much larger than that. Um, let's look at this verse. Uh, same verse, but it's in the message. Um, and that's a wrong reference there. I apologize. It's Ephesians 2, 8. Notice how the message says it. It says, saving is all his idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from the start to the finish. Saving is all his idea, all his work. All we do, <coughs> all we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. Do you understand what he's trying to say? He's trying to say, Paul, Eugene Peterson is trying to take Paul's words here and say, there's nothing we bring to the table. There's nothing we bring to the table when it comes to our salvation. So there's not going to be anything we bring to the table when it comes to living for God and living for his glory. In fact, it's all going to be by grace. Uh, one of the illustrations that I've I've commonly heard, um, it's like you go to go to a car lot um, to buy a car, and you're getting ready and you're getting ready to pay cash, and the and the guy says, um, "Oh, by the way, uh, you, you're going to have to push your car. Um, it doesn't come with an engine." An engine would cost you X number of dollars more. Um, but this is going to be your car, and you're going to have to push it. And, and I think this is the way many of us approach our salvation in Christ Jesus. Our salvation is we say to ourselves, oh, yeah, God, God saved me. He, he's given me this car. But... I'm going to operate like there's no engine in it. I'm going to take this car of salvation and I'm going to push it around town. I'm going to make every effort to make sure that the car um, moves forward rather than saying, no, I just need to turn on the key. God has provided an engine. And that engine is his grace. His grace is not only sufficient for our salvation, but his grace is sufficient for living the good life. Before we do some definitions here, I want to go back and uh, notice what it says here. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. I need to say something here before we... Define what a gift is. <clears throat> Some people have had trouble interpreting this. What, what is the gift? I mean, my series title is The Gift of Grace. Um, but notice that there's some different words here. There's grace, there's saved, and there's faith. Uh, some people have said, well, obviously our faith is even a gift from God. So we can look at this and say, yes, our faith is what saves us. That's a gift. Grace is what saves us. That's a gift. But I think what Paul is trying to emphasize here, he's talking about the whole package. Our sanctification, our glorification, our justification, our salvation, being saved and delivered from the wrath of God. That is a gift. So let's talk about this a little bit more. What is grace? Grace is the unmerited and unearned 
favor of God. Let me repeat this again. Grace is the unmerited, unearned favor of God. Just think about that for a second. And maybe this is why I don't like gifts exchanges and gifts, um, receiving gifts. I want to earn whatever I get. Uh, I guess I'm an athlete. Um, I don't want anything to be given to me. Um, if I'm playing a game, I don't want somebody just to, to sort of give me the gift of the win. Um, I want to earn it. I want to merit it. Um, I don't, I don't want to receive a paycheck from somebody or money from somebody where I haven't earned it or merited it. And that, that's just me. But I think a lot of us are in the same boat. Um, I've, I've, I've met many Christians who love to give gifts. They love to offer hospitality. They love to encourage others. They love to be there uh, to minister to one another. But when somebody tries to give them hospitality, when somebody tries to give them grace, when somebody tries to give them love, when somebody tries to give them encouragement, um, they shoot it down. We can't be shooting it down. It's saying something about our heart. And when it comes to our relationship with our Heavenly Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ, we need to understand that it is grace. And that's why I'm excited to do this series on the gift of grace. And we need to have that definition. It is the unmerited and unearned favor of God. When it comes to grace, probably the best way to uh, describe it is through stories. And so hopefully during this series, as I get my breathing back and my energy back, I will share a lot of stories. Um, but I just want to share with you a little bit of uh, again, my own story. Um, I grew up in a home that I would say was a, uh, a be right home. Uh, somebody once said you either grow up in a be happy home or a be right home. Um, I grew up in a be right home. That means we had to be perfect in our home. Uh, we need to do things right. Um, it was important that we followed the rules, so to speak. Um, there was no shortcuts. There was not going to be anything given to you. Um, you basically had to be perfect. You had to be right. And, you know, when I started to learn about salvation by faith alone, in Christ alone, grace alone, that was great. And to be honest, I was ready to accept that gift. And I, I believe I accepted that gift at a very early age. But here's the problem. Growing up in a be right home or a be perfect home meant that I had to be in control. And I needed to do things in order to earn approval, acceptance, love, affirmation. I don't know where you're at. But some of you might be having trouble accepting this gift of grace, the unmerited, unearned favor or blessing or peace or joy of God. And part of the reason may be you're a control freak. And again, I'm calling myself a control freak, so hopefully you're not offended. Or you're a perfectionist. Or you're trying to play by the rules. This doesn't work that way. You need to just ask yourself, when it comes to your relationship with your Heavenly Father, when it comes to having a relationship with Jesus Christ, are you trying to earn it? Are you accepting it? as a gift. I think we need to define what a gift is because 
Um, you, you can find gift, um, and we'll, we'll talk about this as we go throughout the New Testament, but you can find actually gift in the Old Testament as well. But gift was a present. It was an offering. It was a tribute. I think, again, if we could think of a different story, um, when we think about the, the three wise men, what did they do? They brought gold and frankincense and myrrh. They brought gifts to baby Jesus, to the king. And often what was referred to in the Bible when I was talking about a gift, it was talking about bringing a present or an offering or a tribute, usually to a god, actually, or to a king or to a superior. But what is different here in Ephesians 2.8 when it talks about we receiving the gift of God, it's one of the only references in the New Testament where we're not giving a gift to God, but God is giving a gift to us. The superior, which is God, our creator, our heavenly father, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the almighty God, the Prince of Peace, however you define your Heavenly Father, however you define Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, he gave us a gift. And that gift is salvation. You may say again, salvation from what? Salvation from the wrath of God. Salvation from hell. Salvation from the consequences of sin. I could go on and on throughout this series and help you understand grace by talking about the way we get ourselves into trouble because of our sin. Again, whether it's our pride, our jealousy, our lust, our anger. But God says there's no way there's no way that, Mark Gagline, there's no way that you could ever earn or merit salvation, deliverance from the wrath of God. And so God knew what he needed to do. He needed to give us a gift. And that inexpressible gift is his son, Jesus Christ. And in that gift of his son, Jesus Christ, coming to the cross and dying on the cross for our sins, there needs to be an appreciation for that gift. There needs to be an acceptance of that gift. There needs to be an appropriation of that gift. So we need to, to appreciate it. We need to accept it. And we need to appropriate it. So again, if I could go back here and look at grace, if grace is the unmerited, unfavor, unearned favor of God, if that is true, the moment we are saved, because if you go back and look at this passage, it says that we are saved. But not only are we saved in the past, we are saved in the present, and we're being saved in the future. We're going to need God's grace in our life today. So that we can experience the abundant life that God wanted to give us. Let me tell you a little bit about salvation, and then we'll wrap this up. Salvation, here's a definition, delivered from the wrath of God, solely based on God's grace. It is a gift that must be received by faith. I know faith is sort of like one of those words like love and hope, and what does it exactly mean? But faith means to have trust. It means to have confidence. 
And so some of you may be making a mistake right now. And you're saying, well, if God loves us, even while we're sinners, he's given us the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, but he's given us this gift of salvation, which is based totally on his grace, nothing we do to earn it. Then it's just automatic. It's universal. Yes, it is a universal gift, but it's not a universal application. And I don't know where you're at today, but if you have never trusted in Jesus Christ, that means you have never put your faith, your confidence, your hope, your, your life's well-being into the awesome awareness of God's love and his promise. His promise is clear. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I could share verse after verse. The promise is, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you trust in Christ, you put your faith in Christ, you'll have eternal life. That's his promise. And the provision, we'll look at it as we go throughout this series. The provision was his death on the cross. Christ went to the cross and he died for our sins. <laughs> he died for my sins. He died for your sins. And so it's trusting in the promise of God and trusting in the provision of Christ. And it's realizing that I'm also trusting in the hope that I have in Christ because he rose from the dead. And he's given me life eternal life, abundant life, both now and forevermore. So as we wrap this up, um, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. We're going to do this series on the gift of grace. And I hope even in the midst of my coughing and some of my distractions or my heavy breathing, I pray that you will go back and one, read Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And I also pray that you'll think about grace. And ask yourself, what is grace? I gave you a technical definition, but what does grace look like in your life? What does grace look like in your relationship with your Heavenly Father right now? And I also ask you, if you're like me and you're a control freak and you're trying to make every effort to do things on your own, I want you to understand you can never, ever, ever earn or merit God's favor. It doesn't mean we just throw in <laughs> throw everything in the tank and say, oh, well, I guess God's going to love me and he's going to offer me grace no matter what. No. Again, it says that we need to appropriate it by faith. That means that's where we're going to put our confidence now. No longer put our confidence in ourselves or in my situation. I'm no longer going to put my confidence in Mark Gagline, but I'm going to put my confidence and my Heavenly Father. So as we close, I just want to share one last time with you what I think our next step needs to be. Here's the step I want you to think about. I want you to receive the gift. I don't want to make an assumption here. Some of you have been in church your whole life. Some of you have been trying to live a good life your whole life. Some of you have tried to be committed to Christ and to the word. Um, I hate to break it to you, but you can be committed to church and you can be committed to Christ. You can be committed to his word and committed to trying to be a good person. 
But that doesn't mean you've received the gift of salvation. If I gave you a Christmas gift and you turned around and wrote me a check for it, that's not a gift. You can't write a check for your salvation. You need to receive it. And if you've never, ever received the gift of salvation, uh, let today be that day. And last, share the gift. Uh, share the gift this Christmas. Share it with family, share it with friends, share it with coworkers, share it with neighbors, share it with people at church. And what do I mean by share the gift? You see, if salvation is nothing anybody has to do to earn or merit, we should freely be sharing this gift. Because it's, it's God's gift. And we can't be holding this on and be selfish with it for ourselves, but not tell anybody else about it. So share the gift of salvation. Share the gift of grace. And probably one of the best ways to share the gift of grace is by being a gracious person. Offer grace to others. Shower them with grace. So next week, we're going to pick up right where we left off here. And um, again, thanks for listening to me today and continue to pray for my recovery. And again, I, my hope and prayer is my pneumonia wasn't too bad or my cough to distract you from the truth of God today. And if you have never, ever said yes to Jesus, let today be the day that you say yes to Jesus and yes to his grace. God bless you and look forward to seeing you soon. Redeeming love.
benediction today, I would like to read from the third chapter of the book of Habakkuk. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Amen. Have a great week.